Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning if you're on the West Coast. Uh, I'm Ted Cieslak. I'm a pediatrician and infectious disease physician uh, at the University of Nebraska's Medical Center in Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, I'd like to welcome you all to today's NETEC webinar. Uh, today we're going to talk about laboratory operations, challenges, and innovations. So I'll give you a little bit of boilerplate first, and then I'll turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Jana Broadhurst, uh, and she'll talk about operations. And then we'll go to uh, Tani Ehrensmeyer at uh, Providence Sacred Heart Hospital in Spokane, Washington, one of our NETEC uh, partner institutions. She'll talk about challenges and innovations, and we'll come back and I'll give you um, a few words about some other NETEC resources you can avail yourselves of. Um, and then, in the end, time permitting, we'll take some questions and answers. You may have noticed that at the bottom of your screen, there's a, a button for Q&A. Uh, feel free to submit your questions throughout the course of uh, today's broadcast. Uh, we will answer some of them uh, through the chat room. We'll try to answer others live at the end of this presentation, again, time permitting. Um, and then those that we don't get to, we will ultimately answer and we'll post a Q&A document uh, to the NETEC website within the coming days. So this uh, broadcast today is uh, intended uh, primarily for healthcare workers and uh, laboratorians, uh, but it's also appropriate for uh, administrators, uh, educators, communicators, uh, facilities folks, uh, environmental services people, uh, and the like. So whatever your profession, uh, sit back and enjoy. Uh, I would like to point out at this time that this week is Laboratory Professionals Week. So uh, kudos, big shout out to uh, all of our laboratorians here at Nebraska, at our NETEC partner institutions, and at institutions uh, throughout the country and throughout the world. Obviously, in the face of this uh, COVID outbreak, these folks have been working uh, long hours, doing a phenomenal job getting all of these uh, testing assays and specimens handled. So again, thank you to you all. Uh, there are two main objectives uh, concerning today's webinar. First, to uh, understand the landscape for testing, including the different platforms and the prioritization. And then second of all, to become familiar with the biosafety guidelines and implications surrounding the handling of specimens that might contain SARS-CoV-2. So we do offer continuing medical education and continuing uh, education units for nurses. Uh, in order to receive those credits, you must attend the entire webinar. Uh, because at the end of the webinar, there will be a link to a post-webinar uh, online evaluation, and that must be uh, completed to obtain your certificate. And we'll go over this more at the end of this broadcast. So we are accredited for one contact hour of CEUs or one credit of uh, uh, continuing medical education for physicians. Uh, none of our faculty today have anything to disclose. Uh, you can read more about it if you care. Uh, uh, on the website after this broadcast. Uh, specifically, our main instructors have nothing to declare. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about my favorite topic, us. Um, we are NETEC. NETEC originally stood for the National Ebola Training and Education Center. Our mission has been uh, broadened. Uh, we are now the uh, National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center. So NETEC is actually a second order acronym for one of, where one of the letters, uh, the E, stands for another acronym. Uh, I spent many years in the Army, you'd get a medal for creating a second order acronym. Uh, but our mission here, uh, we consist of a, a conglomeration of institutions that have biocontainment units, and many of our uh, facilities have taken care of uh, highly hazardous communicable diseases in those biocontainment units. And we're very proud of that. But um, I think the real value of NETEC is not uh, does not lie in the fact that we can take care of a few Ebola patients, for example, but rather in the work that we're trying to do to increase the capability of the public health and healthcare systems throughout this nation. So, NETEC uh, provides uh, many services that uh, may be of benefit to you. Uh, we do assessment, um, and uh, we do that through self-assessment as well as through on-site assessment. So, uh, we're a non-punitive, non-regulatory organization, but we're happy to send teams 
uh, to your institutions and work with you to uh, improve your own processes. We also are heavily involved in education. Uh, we offer a number of online and in-person courses, and of course, we offer uh, the very product that you are involved in today, uh, the webinar. Uh, we provide technical assistance and we provide uh, a research network with an online repository, and we're creating the infrastructure as we speak uh, to develop a specimen bio repository. So with all of that said, uh, you can't see me. If you could, you would realize that uh, I'm principally the eye candy here, but I want to now turn it over to the real subject matter expert, my colleague, Dr. Yana Broders. Yana? Great. Thank you, Ted. So I'll spend around the next 15 minutes covering some uh, basic principles of, of laboratory operations um, for uh, clinical diagnosis of COVID-19. So um, I want to start uh, by, by introducing, you know, what it's taken for the world to, uh, to develop diagnostic tests for this novel pathogen. So this is just an, uh, an overview chart of the development of uh, diagnostic tests with emergency use authorization from the FDA. I'm going to talk more about what that means. But I want to put this in some context for the overall um, evolution of this pandemic. So it was just before the new year of, of 2020 that the uh, first uh, you know, disclaimer went out to the world that there was an, an outbreak of undiagnosed pneumonia in, uh, in Hubei province in China. And it was about a week later that Chinese scientists uh, released some information that this this novel pathogen was, was indeed a new strain of, of coronavirus. And just a couple of days later, they, they managed to um, pu publicly post the, uh, the whole genome sequence of this novel virus. And this was absolutely critical to the development of molecular tests uh, for detection of the virus. So then, about another week later, a group in Germany uh, published a, a method for real-time PCR detection of the novel coronavirus, and that was posted to the WHO website. And this really kick-started uh, globally the development of nucleic acid amplification tests for detection of the virus. So this was a really important, uh, and I think a, a success of the global scientific community to, uh, to get this information out and publicly available to spur innovation and, and development globally for diagnostic capabilities. So then the rest of this, uh, this chart shows um, how, how testing has developed in the US. Um, sorry, a couple more comments here. So you know, early on, we had a, uh, the, the CDC test is the first one that you, you can see uh, uptick there in early February. Uh, and there was another public health test that came out of New York uh, a couple of weeks later. But then you see the, the, the chart steeply go up, and this is when uh, a, a variety of commercial and, and laboratory-developed tests became available for clinical laboratories to contribute to diagnosis. So we're going to talk more about what that means, what that framework means. I'll just note briefly that the orange line down there is, um, is speaking to uh, serology tests that uh, have also been issued authorization by the FDA. We're not going to focus on serology testing today. You can see that that is uh, quite literally an up and coming uh, uh, capability, and that will be a topic for a later webinar. So this is a brief overview of some operational considerations uh, that we have when we are uh, thinking through the implementation of a diagnostic test in the clinical laboratory. And I'll speak in, in some more detail about each of these considerations. So, uh, you know, of, of course, we start and when we, we are thinking about the detection of a, of a pathogen with what type of methodology uh, to employ. And our, our typical go-tos, of course, are molecular detection through PCR and, and, uh, and also detection of the host antibody response through serology. Now, I'm not going to focus on the technical components of those methodologies today. And instead, I'm going to talk through uh, really just some practical considerations for the variety of platforms that these types of tests can be run on and what that means um, 
in terms of, of how uh, laboratories and, and hospitals can approach uh, decision making around implementation of different platforms. So we'll talk about the instrumentation involved uh, in running these tests, uh, and then as well, what's the throughput, meaning how many tests can be performed in a day or in a week. The cost of those tests, of course, is an important consideration. And some of the things that we, uh, I think, uh, aren't um, so focused on typically, but has become a, a really important aspect of our, of our considerations for this response in terms of uh, specimen collection requirements and, and um, how the specimen impacts the performance of the test, and as well as staffing requirements, which really speaks to the complexity of the, of the method and platform chosen. So let's take a minute to just um, look over the, the from a 30,000 foot view, uh, the, the regulatory framework of, of, of diagnostic tests used. So certainly in, in regular times, the, the vast majority of tests being run in a clinical laboratory are FDA cleared tests. These are tests that are commercially available um, and are, are typically um, you know, run as, as uh, kits in the lab. However, it is certainly a part of, of the practice of laboratory medicine uh, to develop testing methods that we can call in-house tests. These are, these are tests that um, you know, may, may, may utilize uh, reagents and components that are, that are developed in the laboratory um, or, or put together from a variety of uh, commercial uh, ingredients. And, and the, the methodology from, from start to finish is validated uh, you know, per CLIA guidelines in the laboratory just for use in that laboratory. So that validated test does not extrapolate out to use in, in other laboratories. Now, this is a routine part, I said, of, a, of our practice, and typically different laboratories who may serve niche populations and have a need for um, non-commercially available tests may, may go this route. Now, uh, both of these um, avenues with commercially available tests and laboratory developed tests in the context of a declared public health emergency do require an emergency use authorization from the FDA. And so something that, you know, really hit the headlines uh, early on in the response um, uh, with, with concerns around potential delays in testing capabilities because of this requirement. But of course, it's, uh, it's quite important to, to have a framework for, for review of, of the accuracy of, of the test uh, uh, employed and, and the uh, stringency of validation uh, around that. So uh, suffice to say, everything that's out there um, now in use in clinical laboratories um, for molecular uh, detection of the virus, uh, that graph that I showed to start with, um, that's speaking to those with emergency use authorization from the FDA. So now uh, getting down to a bit more nuts and bolts about implementation requirements for uh, these different types of tests. So when we talk about commercially available tests uh, versus laboratory developed tests, we really are talking about uh, quite a, uh, uh, different regimes in the, uh, typically the complexity of those tests, but, but certainly the instrumentation involved. And, and you know, those, those in the audience who are, are um, you know, practicing laboratorians, I, I don't need to belabor this point, but for those uh, who are, you know, perhaps more on the administrative side of, of hospital, um, of the hospital and, and decision making around test implementation, uh, may be less familiar with uh, these types of platforms. So the laboratory developed tests that are that uh, that are in use, particularly for again a nucleic uh, a PCR detection of 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 the of uh, pathogen nucleic acid. These, these are uh, typically open platforms that are, are adaptable to the, the development of new tests and involve a, a multi-step process of extracting the nucleic acid um, out of the specimen and uh, then amplifying the, um, the targets, the pathogen-specific targets. So that's a multi-step process. This is, um, this, is, uh, this is considered high-complexity testing from a CLIA standpoint. Um, and it, it's uh, quite labor intensive and requires very experienced staff to do this. And, um, and, and there's quite a variety of, of extraction and amplification platforms that are utilized across clinical laboratories. Um, but, uh, but certainly not all laboratories are equipped with this type of, of 
of open platform uh, instrumentation that allows, again, for the development of tests uh, through, this, through this method. Now, uh, conversely, uh, commercially available tests, um, many that we use these days for pathogen detection are performed on sample to answer platforms. And that means that that extraction and amplification process all occurs within an automated instrument that requires only the loading of the sample um, with an answer provided at the end. Now, again, there's a variety of these platforms and hospitals may have uh, 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 different, um, different platforms on board for, for infectious disease testing. Um, and there's quite, quite a few considerations uh, within that category as well. Now that testing tends to be lower complexity. Some of it is even considered waived and um, uh, we can talk, a, I, I'll, I'll touch on a couple that have uh, uh, been designated as waived because that certainly has important operational considerations. Okay, and then uh, finally, I'll just say that, um, you know, the uh, requirements in the lab for validating the method, of course, uh, also differ between these uh, commercially available and laboratory developed tests. So for laboratory developed tests, the onus is on the laboratory to do um, the, uh, the, the complete set of, of you know, uh, defining sensitivity and, and specificity, both analytically and clinically. I'm not going to go into detail there, but it is, a, it is quite an intensive process. Um, whereas the onboarding of a, of a commercially available test that's, that's achieved that uh, FDA authorization um, requires a verification process that is considerably um, uh, less intensive than the entire validation. So, you know, it's, it's um, not surprising after, after that introduction that, that not every laboratory um, you know, has the, the bandwidth um, or the resources to pursue a laboratory developed test. So, you, you know, about, um, you know, I, it's actually really probably a third of the, the currently authorized tests out there are laboratory developed uh, with EUAs. Um, and, you know, those um, were able to start earlier because they, they didn't require the supplies, the, the manufactured supplies that uh, to be commercially available. But now, as we're in a later phase of, of test development, um, a growing number of the available tests are on these commercially available platforms. So again, there's uh, quite, quite a difference in the instrumentation involved um, in the implementation of, of, of uh, COVID tests. And I'll just say now, you know, that I noted that there's um, 58 and growing uh, EUA tests out there, and again, about two-thirds of those are commercially available, and those will be most relevant to uh, uh, the, 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 the broader clinical laboratory community. Um, those platforms now span everything from, uh, from very high-throughput automated platforms um, that, that can load, you know, uh, even um, hundreds of samples at, at a time, allowing a laboratory, if they have the, uh, the, the supplies, uh, available to run, uh, you know, uh, uh, more than a thousand tests a day, and that may be um, uh, that may suit the use of, of a higher uh, of a higher throughput service. Of course, we now uh, have platforms that um, that are that are approved for uh, for use even outside of the laboratory. So there are three platforms now with uh, approval from the FDA for use. Um, at the uh, uh, outside of the laboratory and uh, near patient care, so those are are waived for for testing by non laboratory personnel. So that's an, a very important consideration as well. And there there are pros and cons to all of these platforms. So you know I've I've listed some of them here. Uh, I've touched on the throughput of those tests, the the footprint. You know how much room do they take up, and what are their infrastructure requirements. Um, the, the cost of these tests varies quite a lot, and, and the ease of use, again, so that speaks to the complexity of the testing and what uh, personnel requirements there may be. So, so, you know, how to boil all of this down, really, uh, I think my, my biggest take-home message um, at the end of all this, you know, and we'll get into a few more specifics, but is really that with all of the tools available, there's not going to be one best test for any uh, clinical laboratory. It's, it's going to be a, com a combination of, of all of these considerations to define 
what makes the most sense for you for your use case what's the volume of testing that's that's going to need to be done um, and, and you know what are the resources available the space in your laboratory the, the staffing that's available um, and and who who are the what's the patient population you know that you're looking to serve if you're looking to uh, to perform this testing on on symptomatic hospitalized patients versus for example um, a, a broader screening strategy uh, in the community so so my, my biggest take home is that uh, there's not one best test you'll notice here that I'm not focusing at all on the performance specifications of these tests because I think there's there's a temptation to say well I want to run the most sensitive test um, uh, and and there's um, just quite a lot of interpretation uh, to be had there and uh, such a variety of, of additional operational considerations that we're, we're choosing to focus here on, on the bigger picture. So to, um, to touch again on, on the, the breadth of platforms and, and what will make sense for a given laboratory, um, so it's quite important to consider whether or not there are any manual steps in the processing of the specimen for a given method. And this, is, this can be really, um, I think, glossed over when a test is advertised um, uh, and, and how it's used. And um, this, is, this is of utmost importance as well uh, for, for the biosafety considerations involved in performing the test. So manual steps um, you know, really uh, increase the exposure of, of the laboratorian uh, to the specimen and uh, should often be Performed in a biosafety cabinet, and so that's a you know quite a quite an important consideration. So is it uh, are there manual components versus is it fully automated? And again, the the the, the capacity in terms of number of tests that can be run. So again, this this can this can range anywhere from you know thousands of tests a day to uh, single cartridge based tests that that may be more suitable for lower volumes um, and uh, and um, you know, for, for particular patient populations. The cost of the test. So there's, there's a lot that's built in ultimately to the cost of a test. And I think actually something that we've learned with this response is that uh, money doesn't always buy you testing. And um, we'll hear more in the latter half of this uh, presentation around some of those challenges. But should these things be available, um, uh, this is all going to be considered in, in your uh, implementation plan. So, um, you know, there's, there's the upfront cost of the instrument, and that can, uh, you know, be important, as I said, for uh, many of these commercially available tests. Uh, hosp hospital laboratories have these um, platforms in place. And that, uh, that can be a, a, a very important uh, determining factor in, in which test is chosen to be implemented. Reagents and consumables vary widely, um, uh, particularly in their, in their um, availability. And again, the complexity of the test is going to determine uh, the labor involved. And uh, you know, staffing considerations are, are, again, a big challenge that we'll hear about later on. So I mentioned biosafety considerations, and, um, and in particular, thinking through the steps that would need to be performed in a biosafety cabinet. And I'm going to highlight a, a couple of examples here just to um, try to make this consideration more tangible. There's, there's a list of things that we um, it's, uh, generally consider to be potentially aerosol-generating procedures in the laboratory um, that may be uh, relevant to um, you know, testing for uh, for SARS-CoV-2, but also in, um, in the manipulation of, of specimens for, for other types of, of, um, of testing in a specimen that may contain the virus. So this is all, um, you know, really critical to, to the development of, of laboratory procedures during, this, during the time of this pandemic. And again, I just want to highlight a couple of examples um, that, that I think we're, we're not obvious up front as uh, laboratory directors were considering the, the variety of platforms that they may uh, take on. So um, one consideration, uh, speaking now to, um, you know, this conventional RT-PCR type of method where you have a, a raw specimen that you then um, you go through extraction before amplification. So that requires, um, uh, before anything, and an activation of that specimen, and we often call that lysis. 
Of course, at the start of the outbreak, we had very little data on, on the efficacy of different methods of viral inactivation. And so that was, a, that was a challenge for laboratory directors in implementing methods and understanding um, the, the safety of handling specimens um, uh, as, as then that, that uh, for latter steps in the workflow. So there, there is some more information now, and, and um, as well as uh, what's been extrapolated from other coronaviruses, and, and that's been um, you know, made, made now, uh, that information is now more widely available. Now for, auto, for more automated platforms, um, this is a really important consideration as well. And you know, for automated commercially available uh, tests, there's a bit less uh, flexibility in how to modify the workflows. And so this is, again, um, uh, really the responsibility of, of the laboratory leadership to, to consider fully. And I'll, I'll highlight two examples that um, are, uh, you know, fairly widely uh, used or at least familiar, familiar platforms now. And one is the, um, the higher throughput COBOS uh, platform um, for, uh, that's uh, manufactured by Roche. Um, so that's one that's in, in use in many laboratories for a, a variety of infectious disease testing. And... Uh, requires the loading of, of open tubes onto the automated instrument. So there you have a, a challenge of transferring specimen uh, to um, you know, a prescribed uh, type of tube that, that then has to be uh, carried over to the instrument and loaded. That may seem quite trivial when, when one is considering all of these other components of, of uh, operationalizing a test that we've talked about, but that can really make it or break it. So, you know, if you, you have to develop that workflow and ensure, you know, uh, above all, the safety of your laboratory personnel, uh, it, it's, it's much more than an afterthought. And um, that's, that's been um, you know, something that uh, has been solved in different ways by, by different laboratory directors. The, you know, the other example that I'll give is, is the implementation of testing at the point of, at the point of care. So these are tests that uh, you know are are performed outside of the laboratory environment and, and typically by personnel who uh, who don't um, have all of the same background in handling specimens. So um, I'll, I'll just uh, illustrate the example of the Abbott ID Now test that uh, is is advertised for use at the point of care. That also involves the transfer of specimen into an open specimen cup with um, with uh, mixing of the specimen that can certainly uh, has the potential to spill or generate aerosol. So while that may be very attractive and, and even has CLIA uh, wave status for performance outside of the laboratory, that's, that's such an important consideration for the safety of the personnel and for um, you know, ma maintaining the safety of the environment that isn't, isn't so clear up front when one is, one is considering all the other factors of, of implementing the test. So, um, so this, I think, is, is, um, is something we, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about, and again, is, is not always at the, on, in, in, the, in the large print um, around uh, you know, the, the specifications of a test, and when this really falls on the onus of the institution and, and, and leadership to, to think through and develop the appropriate procedures to maintain safety in and outside of the laboratory. So I'll just end by coming back, uh, coming back to this slide. You know, this, this slide uh, could be interpreted pretty optimistically. You know, we have you know, currently 58 nucleic acid amplification tests for detection of, of SARS-CoV-2 that have emergency use authorization by the FDA. That's a lot of tests. Um, uh, that's, that's certainly far more tests than we, we typically have available for, um, for, for diagnosis of a pathogen. But we know and we see in the news every day and we, we hear on our, our own institutional conference calls every day um, that, that there's not enough testing capacity. So, you know, how do we explain this, this, you know, apparent discrepancy between the availability of, of approved diagnostic tests and the ability to implement these tests broadly enough to satisfy, uh, you know, the um, potential for, for expanded testing that many are calling for. And so that really speaks, you know, to the, the challenges in, in, in uh, executing these implementation factors that, um, that I discussed in the first part of this talk. So uh, with that, I will hand over to uh, my colleague, Tani, to talk about challenges.
Thanks, Jana. Um, good morning, everyone. And this is Tony Arnsmeyer. I'm the Regional Manager of Laboratory Quality, Regulatory Safety, and Point of Care at Providence Sacred Heart Medical Center in Spokane, Washington. Uh, we're the Region 10 Treatment Center, and I manage the Special Pathogens Unit, Laboratory, and Team. So this is a quote that I ran across the other day, and I felt it was just very appropriate for these interesting times that everyone's experiencing. I'm thinking many of us on this call are finding out just how tall we are, and I'm hoping it's going well for everyone. What we'd like to help focus on today is um, knowing these, uh, you know, highlighting these, these times, what our challenges are, and then put, potentially give you some little golden nuggets to help you uh, with some innovations that, that could address this challenge. So first of all, we'll talk about supply chain challenges. A lot of this is not going to be news to everybody, but it just really puts it all together and highlights um, all of the challenges that we're facing that we have never experienced before. General delays and back orders of crucial items are really creating downtimes in the laboratory or at the very least really increasing our turnaround times. It's, it's um, back orders and uh, delays that we've not experienced and probably didn't anticipate to this level. When you get down to the equipment level, like Yana mentioned, um, open channel analyzers are needed to develop laboratory, uh, to do laboratory developed tests. And they're not necessarily common in all laboratories. If you are trying to produce a quick response to the demands for testing that's needed, um, if before the EUA tests were available, only laboratories with the open channel analyzers are, were able to implement LDTs. So, um, you know, as things become more available, commercially available, uh, we will be able to increase our testing capacity, but there has been, there was a bit of a stall um, from what I could tell and what we experienced in, in getting a quick test time delay or getting a quick test uh, response. So once that testing is available, however, commercially available, the demands for testing easily can exceed the capacity of the analyzers. Um, additional analyzers can help. It's, it's one of the um, innovations that we can discuss, but the, the issue is uh, being addressed by vendors as well. They're really facing the same challenges and how to get analyzers to the areas of greatest need, how to produce them quickly, how to make them available to uh, meet the high demand. And then when we get to our reagents, the individual reagents shortages have occurred um, due to inability to import products, potentially the inability to just keep up with demand. And um, as the commercially de developed or available EUA test kits come out, you know, they're being put on allocation as soon as they are released. So that creates additional challenges in how to uh, utilize the allocations that you've received. If we continue on with supply chain challenges, the specimen collection and testing supplies um, shortages, as John, Yana had um, mentioned earlier, you know, I think that was a bit of one of the unexpected things that we have test specific transport media that's been in shortage, test specific collection swabs. When, uh, when a test is approved or reviewed by the FDA or an EUA comes out, it's usually put out with recommendations or requirements of what media and collection swabs can be used for that analyzer or test system. So what do we do if we've got a test specific transport media that we cannot find any longer? Um, also validations are necessary if you're, if you're having to change transport media or swabs, there's potential for needed additional validations of that um, collection system. And then the personal protective equipment, you know, not, not any news for anybody. It's, it's all over the news, but it's a laboratory consideration in how do we provide this protective material, protective equipment to our staff to keep them safe. Not only the masks, the pappers, the face shields, gloves, but some people are also experiencing laundry delays. If, you're, if you have lab coats that potentially you have laundered through a service, that service may be short staffed, may have had to um, shut down, and how do you potentially deal with laundry delays and, and not having lab coats for everyone? 
So let's talk a little bit about potential solutions for these supply chain demands. Um, think about, do you have available instrumentation that can be centralized to a high demand location? Um, for instance, there's been hotspots that have pulled all available instruments to a single location to meet testing demands in that specific high risk population. Kind of a, um, a, a, a factory of putting out a whole lot of results at once to serve that high risk area. Uh, there's been rental of, of instruments that can meet demands of the COVID testing or other testing, such as flu, that's part of a rule out al algorithm. Uh, are you able to, have, to rent additional instruments to meet these high demands? Healthcare systems have also negotiated with vendors to receive single allocations and then they are determining how to distribute that single allocation by need, by prevalence, by epidemiological risk. So uh, what about also giving priority of available local testing to critical populations, inpatients, emergency department patients um, for quick, quick rule out? Not only does quick rule out um, help with provider decisions, but it helps to conserve PPE and to um, identify high-risk populations, um, uh, infections in maybe long-term care or homeless populations. So how can you use your allocations? How can you use your resources in the areas of highest need? And then for those areas that are, of course, high need, but perhaps not um, the most critical populations, can you send all the rest of the testing to a reference lab to conserve what you've been allocated, allocated excuse me, uh, given to perform locally? Uh, I think resilience and versatility are really a must in this environment. If you have more than one platform, it, it's really important so that if one goes down, then you or maybe you've got supplies for that one platform that become avail unavailable, are you um, then unable to perform testing at all? If you have more than one platform, you can then switch to the alternate that perhaps you um, have more supplies for. I know that this goes against typical lab desires to standardize, but it does seem necessary in today's environment. Um, when you get to the, the um, collection supplies, if you don't have your OP specimen, your, um, can you use oral pharyngeal specimens instead of an NP swab? What about other transport media? Can you validate others against your system, perhaps Amy's or saline? Um, we've also had other research facilities that have been able to produce their own. And are you able to use their transport media? And again, that the homemade medias that are available have become um, really quite in demand. And um, so do you, do you, what about testing requirements that allow for a lesser volume of media? We switched to a media with one mil in it for certain platforms that required a lesser volume to test. We also have uh, solved a problem with if you have kits uh, that are in more supply, maybe you don't have a bigger demand for other collection kits. Can you rob those swabs from the other collection kits to use for your COVID testing? Is a PPE decontamination program available in your area that you can use to recycle and reuse your PPE? We've also got homemade baths. Perhaps, perhaps you've got uh, made some uh, recommendations within facilities where homemade masks can be worn if you are in a, a non-clinical area or you're not using, performing those non, those uh, aerosol generating procedures. So if you are in a, a lower risk area, can you conserve PPE through using homemade masks? And if you don't have N95 masks, can you substitute those for others, such as a face shield with goggle or goggles um, with a mask and perhaps a papper? So let's talk a little bit about the operational challenges. Um, you know, we've got a sudden increase in test volume, very sudden and very unexpected, not planned for. This creates staffing and workload difficulties. 
Uh, the demands are being placed uh, many times on low staff shifts. How do we provide this testing round the clock with a night shift that is typically very low staffed? How do we get that? How do we get that increased throughput? Um, you know, dealing on uh, with not only low staff due to typical staffing uh, patterns, but also potentially having employees that are out on um, on an illness leave. There's also imbal imbalances in workload that are occurring due to low census for areas such as elective surgery. And some areas of the lab might be slow while others are facing high volume. Other departments within a hospital also could be experiencing a surge such as respiratory therapy who may be performing the blood gas testing in your hospital, but they're also dealing with a high clinical workload due to increased number of patients on ventilators. So how do we balance those demands? If you don't have the engineering controls, like what if you don't have a biosafety cabinet? Many of those physicians offices and non-laboratory um, areas that Yana was speaking of doing the wave testing um, may not have a biosafety cabinet to uh, protect their staff. And then while communication is vital, Many are experiencing just a, a communication overload. Not only is there a lot of information coming out all the time, but it just changes very rapidly. And information and safety recommendations, um, the, the frequency of changing, um, it, it can create a real uneasiness or fear in staff. Staff are nervous and afraid, especially those in a high-risk group or those that are caring for somebody at high risk. So next slide, we'll talk about the potential operational solutions. What can we do about all of these challenges? Um, first of all, can batch testing frequency be increased during shifts with more staffing? Can you, um, can you increase the number of batches during your day shift when you have more staff? What can you do for night shift? Perhaps it's going to be a matter of just communicating out the turnaround times that you can experience during certain periods of time. And maybe you're going to have to communicate that the testing times are limited to a certain um, time frame. And as long as that is well defined and advertised, that may be the best way that your facility will have to meet these increased demands. Uh, how can lab staff assist with those areas experiencing a surge? Um, for instance, can lab staff be trained on the respiratory therapy blood gas analyzers to help those, those help staff those blood gas laboratories um, that are typically operated by respiratory therapy? Uh, one thing that we have done with our special pathogens unit, uh, once, we, once we were um, finished and had discharged, our federally quarantined uh, patients, we did deactivate our, our uh, special pathogens unit and turn that into a COVID unit. So rather than have our special pathogens unit team staff that laboratory, the respiratory therapists that were already taking care of those patients were then allowed into our special pathogens unit lab to use our equipment, which was the same equipment they had used upstairs in their um, respiratory therapy labs. So. Um, that is how one of the things that can be done to help with surges in other areas. Um, can you relocate a biosafety cabinet? That might, might seem a little bit rash, but what if you have one that is in an area perhaps not being used as frequent, frequently, but is in a really high need, um, could be moved to a high need area? If you can't relocate it, can you perhaps relocate your testing um, material, testing supplies, um, perhaps your, uh, the, the steps that are a high risk could be done in your biosafety cabinet and then moved to the analyzers. And then if you um, have a versatility in methods, again, that will help to alleviate your supply chain issues if you can have more than one platform um, to eliminate not only the supply chain issues, but perhaps downtime. And then one of the really great things that we've been gathering uh, tidbits of information is 
is uh, considering specific teams to aid in implementation. Yana expressed all of the all of the uh, complications of implementing a new test, especially if you're doing a lab developed lab developed test and and also implementing quickly. And they have used really good really good examples of teams. So using a supply chain team to just focus on the supply chain issues with getting a new test in house. Uh, a team to aid with communication of the testing availability or communication between the different teams when you're developing this test. A team that specifically works on the resulting and reporting, perhaps there's interfacing that needs to be done. Uh, perhaps there is uh, communication between your uh, physicians that are going to be um, ordering your tests. So think about teams that can be designed to uh, to implement small pieces of the big project. And also, are there teams that can help to organize volunteers? I know that worldwide, you know, there's been a lot of volunteers to um, that are willing to help. And, and can you have a team that will help with those volunteers? I, at this point, I'm going to turn this back over to Ted and hopefully you'll have some questions that we can address. Well, thank you so much, uh, Tan, and uh, thanks uh, also to Yana for these um, very interesting and informative presentations. Before we go on any further, I do want to mention a little bit uh, more about NETEC and the resources we have. Um, we've got a few questions that we may try to tackle today. Um, but we're always here to answer questions about this topic and any other uh, topics you might have related to NETEC's mission. So uh, send your questions to info at NETEC.org. Uh, we're also uh, very willing to offer technical assistance, either in person uh, or over the phone. And you can submit requests for that technical assistance to our website at NETEC.org. Relative to today's topic, there are many other resources I would call your attention to. Uh, some of them are listed here, and we'll post the slide set from this talk, uh, as well as a lot of other information on the NETEC website within the next 24 to 48 hours. So uh, that brings us to our uh, time for questions and answers. Again, you can continue to submit questions through the Q&A button. Uh, on your computer screen, uh, or alternatively, you can send them uh, to us at the website and uh, we'll tackle them uh, as they come in. I want to go to the first question, though. Uh, it seems that the Food and Drug Administration has gone from being traditionally uh, over um, uh, easy, I guess, or over strict, uh, I guess, if you will, uh, overly rigorous, uh, to now giving. Uh, emergency use authorization to any manufacturer, basically. And, and the uh, question writer uh, voices the opinion that, uh, that these tests, therefore, sometimes seem to have erratic sensitivity and specificity. So the question is, will we find out later that those tests were less useful than we had hoped? So I'll toss that to our experts for their opinion. Yana? Sure, thank you. It's a, it's a great question. Thank you um, for posing it, Glenn. So, yeah, there's, there's been, um, you know, a journey uh, with the FDA over the course of this pandemic, um, you know, where uh, there was a sense that there was um, an, 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 uh, a burden, a regulatory burden that was uh, stifling the, uh, the laboratory response. And you know that's now uh, shifted to some concern that uh, there are there are tests available that um, have not been uh, rigorously evaluated. I, I will uh, assure everyone that um, there's a lot there's a lot more uh, out there um, that that does not meet uh, EUA requirements. So yes, this is still a this is still a you know a, a very substantial review process that tests uh, are are going through. Um, to get that emergency use authorization. Now, um, I would actually draw a parallel here between um, 
uh, you know, some of the open access literature um, that's that's been made available. Uh, you know, some some folks have asked me, you know, do we do we think it's good that that um, you know papers are are getting pushed out without all the same peer review that we're used to? And my my response is really, well, it puts the onus on you as the reader to to evaluate what's there and to you know think through it critically and draw conclusions. And we have to do the same thing, I think, with uh, with the variety of of tests that are available to. So, you know, through the, the FDA website, um, there is quite a lot of information available on each test that comes out, including what, um, what validation data is available uh, for those tests. Now, of, of most concern in many of the uh, um, molecular detection tests that have the FDA authorization, there is not uh, true clinical performance data meaning that the test has not been evaluated in primary clinical specimens to understand how well it performs for a given uh, population. And that's something that we, uh, we, we, we typically rely heavily on for understanding uh, and predicting how a test will perform in our own, uh, in our own laboratories. So I will note that, that uh, for many, even most, of the tests that are available, they, uh, they lack that piece of data. And it, it can be a bit of a treacherous road to try to compare instead the, the analytic sensitivity that is, um, that is uh, provided in these uh, performance evaluation documents. They're often expressed in different terms, very different types of experiments may have been performed to generate that, that uh, determination of, of limit of detection or analytic sensitivity. So um, I think that there, there are challenges as, um, you know, as a as a decision maker in navigating based on what's available through through the um, through the uh, EUA process, but um, but it 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 I think it does require one to just think very critically about the performance data that is available, um, and as well as the growing body of literature that is now that is now coming out. So um, you know, I I do encourage folks not only to to see what is available through the EUA documentation on the FDA website, um, but to you know search for the literature uh, both both peer reviewed and non, because you know as, as I as I started out by saying uh, there's there's a lot of effort to get data out uh, and publicly available quickly, and that means utilizing um, you know uh, uh, open um, uh, literature uh, forums that that get the data out you know before it's gone through a formal peer review process. That data can be very, very useful. Again, it just has to be read with a very critical eye. And there's uh, just a, a really exponentially growing number of, of, of studies out there that are comparing different platforms, looking at different specimen types, collection devices, um, you know, alternate, uh, um, uh, you know, processing steps. So a couple of the other questions that, that came up um, here that we'll, we'll take more time to address um, offline do speak to you know, how to how to approach the the validation of um, you know different uh, different transport media different specimen types these are these are really great questions um, these are the you know challenges being faced uh, by many for the first time and um, there there are good uh, sort of uh, practice guidelines out there but now again um, really also a, a growing body body of literature to provide good examples of how others have have solved that problem so we can point to some of that literature. Um, and, and make that available. Well, thanks so much, Yana. Let's go on to the next question. Um, the uh, participant asks, which instruments would you recommend uh, for uh, high reliability and specificity? So, uh, Tani, do you want to tackle that? Um, you know, I'll, I'll chime in, but I think Yana would also be able to, to shed some really um, clear light on this. Although I'm not sure there is any real clear answer here. I think um, one of the things that we have realized with the two platforms that we're utilizing is that there is definitely a difference in sensitivity between the two analyzers, the two platforms. Uh, I don't know that she mentioned, you know, we don't have really good data that we normally would have when we begin testing with a new platform. So uh, I really can't give a um, a recommendation on a specific platform. Uh, Yana, do you have any further 
ideas of how you would best select something that works for you other than taking into account all of the um, pieces of information you already gave with what is actually going to be available and what will actually fit into your space and meet your staff uh, abilities. Yeah, thanks, Tanya. I really think those are the main considerations. Just to um, you know, speak to these uh, aspects of the question, um, you know, specificity is is not something we are too concerned about with the available assays. Pardon me, molecular assays for uh, for COVID-19. Um, you know that that will change quite a lot uh, when we when we talk about serology tests, and that's not something we'll launch into here. That'll be a topic for later discussion. But uh, you know, really, the the specificity of the nucleic acid amplification test is very good, and not one um, that I think would would force you to choose one test over another. In terms of reliability, I think the the, the best um, advice to give is that uh, again, there's um. I think for most laboratories, there is there's uh, uh, enough tests available now that uh, there's probably an ability to implement a test on on an existing platform where you have you know the institutional experience to um, uh, to know how that's operating in in your hands. I know that's not a um, you know pointing to instruments A, A, B, and C as being as being the most reliable. I think that's really going to depend mostly on um, you know what. What institutional experience a, a laboratory has with an existing platform, and and that being a good way to go. This is Thanks. Tony again. I, I, one other thing that I would probably recommend is to reach out to the vendors that have the platforms available that you would like to consider. Um, one thing that we ran into is while we would have loved to use platform A. Uh, there just wasn't availability in test kits considering the allocations that um, they had already issued. And if you don't have the instrument platform itself, the instrument itself, there may be difficulties with a vendor getting that to you. So you might have to look around uh, at several options to see even what you are able to get. Thanks, Tani and Yana. We'll have uh, one more question. Uh, so the question is, do you think we'll need different molecular tests for asymptomatic populations uh, versus symptomatic uh, patients? And I'll, I'll start with that. Um, so in symptomatic patients, your pretest probability is much higher. Um, and so you want a test that um, is uh, very specific. On the other hand, in an asymptomatic population, your pretest probability is much lower, and you might uh, therefore look for uh, specificity instead of sensitivity. With that said, most of these molecular tests are um, very specific and very sensitive. So uh, that's the end of my knowledge on this topic, and I'll turn it over to Yana or Tani to comment further. Thanks, Ted. I'll, I'll give a brief response to this one. I know we're nearly out of time. But, um, you know, we're, we're learning a lot more with some, um, you know, studies that are coming out really from, from across the globe on the kinetics of viral load over the course of illness. And we're, we are starting to learn a, a, a little bit about how that looks in, um, in individuals uh, prior to the onset of symptoms. It does look as though uh, viral loads do peak around the time of symptom onset. You know, so, you know, from a diagnostic perspective, uh, we've been thrown a bit of a softball there. Um, it, uh, the, the viral loads are typically quite high at, a at the time when a patient presents for care um, with, with symptoms. So uh, that, I think, um, means that we have a bit more uh, flexibility in the sensitivity of the test used for that, um, uh, for, for catching the disease, uh, detecting the virus at the onset of symptoms. So if you're talking about asymptomatic populations, you know, presumably, um, <laughs> of course, there's, there's going to be a ramp up in that viral load. And so, um, you know, you would presumably need a, a more uh, analytically sensitive test uh, to detect the lower, lower viral loads as that, um, as it uh, rises prior to the onset of symptoms. And we are learning that there is, well, well you know, across the board, these molecular detection methods are, are generally, um, you know, fairly comparable in their, in their sensitivity. There are differences, 
and uh, those differences can come down to uh, to the um, method of the test. Not all of these te uh, nucleic acid amplification tests are PCR based. Um, there's uh, you know other um, isothermal amplification methods that are are in use, particularly in point of care devices. So that's something to keep an eye on. Again, the literature is going to be uh, growing and and robust over time with method comparisons, and that will be certainly part of the operational consideration moving forward and how these tests are used and, and in which population. Well, thanks so much, Yana. That's unfortunately all we have time for. If your question didn't get answered, uh, we will provide written answers, uh, and there'll be a question and answer sheet attached to our website. So just to reiterate what I said in the beginning, we are offering CME and CEUs uh, in order to register for yours, complete the post-webinar online evaluation. You'll get a five-digit code. You'll use that to obtain your certificate, and you have 60 days from the uh, from today to do that. I want to thank you for uh, joining in today, uh, and I'd encourage you to avail yourselves of our other offerings, uh, to frequently visit the netech.org website for um, additional information and training opportunities. Uh, again, feel free to email us any questions you might have related to this topic or other uh, NETEC topics at info at NETEC.org. I also want to finally put a plug in. Our next uh, webinar will be uh, next Wednesday at 1 p.m. Central Time. Uh, it'll be on crisis standards of care. Uh, and then two days later, next Friday, also at 1 p.m. Central Time, uh, we'll be doing a deeper dive into the issue of proning, the placement uh, of patients into the prone position for better ventilation. With that said, again, this is Ted Cieslak from the University of Nebraska Medical Center and NETEC. Uh, thank you very much. Have a good rest of your day and your weekend.